Hello everyone out there in YouTube land. Welcome back to Diego Knows. I, of course, am Diego. And today I'm gonna to continue talking about my uh, destruction of Pretty Woman. That's right, Pretty Woman, that piece of shit fucking movie from 1990 uh, that swindled all of you women out there that were alive back then that watched it and thought this shit was fucking real. Uh, if you thought it was real, I bet you saw Star Wars and you thought that shit was real too, huh? <laughs> Oh my God, Pretty Woman. I have no idea why this movie had such an effect on women at that time. It was part of the zeitgeist. I remember 1990 very well. I was a teenager and I just remember the effect this movie had on you women was uh, unbelievable. I mean, everyone quoted it. They kept watching it over and over again. You know, they kept listening to that fucking song, that Pretty Woman song by Roy Orbison. That came out in 1964, okay? So that was a good fucking 20... Uh, like 25 years earlier, and you started hearing it on the radio all the fucking time. And I also the other piece of shit song, uh, I'll Get Over You, I Know I Will. Because that, that show was, that song was in the opening credits of this fucking movie anyway. But anyway, the point is this movie had a big impact on women. It was a rom-com. It was one of the fucking king of the rom-coms. Well, not, not maybe not the king, but one of them. Definitely royalty when it comes to the rom-com genre. Uh, and it influenced a lot of women out there. It made Julia Roberts a star. It rebooted uh, Richard Gere's career, which he fucked up on his own later when he criticized China. Um, you know, so it had a lot of influence on people, on women, in particular in America. Okay, uh, the biggest problem I had, I had no problem with the genre itself. Okay, I, I, me personally, I like action movies. I like superhero movies. I like, you know, stuff like that, martial arts movies, military movies. You know, I, I like things like that. But, you know, there's, I have watched a few, uh, you know, a few rom-coms, a few chick flicks in my life. And there's some that are better than others, you know. And I decided, like, okay, well, I can talk about the movies that I like. Like, for example, tonight I'm going to go see Black Adam. Okay, that's the kind of movie I, I like. Okay, but there's a lot of YouTubers out there that are already reviewing that. Okay, they're going to review that, you know, uh, they're going to tell you all about it, okay? Now, I'm a straight guy, okay, so I look at these rom-coms from a different point of view. I'm not some one of your gay friends, I'm not one of your girlfriends, okay? I've already reviewed all the Sex and the City episodes, I already understand the genre, okay? Uh, what I want is I want to give you a straight man's point of view, an honest to God straight man's point of view. I have nothing to gain by lying to you. So I'm going to tell you honestly what a straight guy thinks. And most straight guys did not watch this movie. Or if they did, they watched it because their wives watched it, their girlfriends made them watch it. That kind of shit. But most guys do not go out of their way to watch this movie on their own. Not straight guys, at least, okay? Well, I'm going to give you a straight man's point of view. I'm going to tell you exactly what a real guy, a straight guy, would think about these situations, these actresses, these uh, stories, the director, all that kind of shit. That's what I do here, okay? I'm going to give you a straight man's point of view. The real question is, can you handle it? Can you handle the truth? Because that's what you're going to get today. Straight up, baby. And there's no lube here. No lube. So I hope you're ready for it. I hope you can handle it. Okay. Now we are on part 14. Yeah, part 14. Of, <laughs> of, of, of Pretty Woman from 1990. Holy shit, man. How many videos have we got to make uh, to, to dissect a pretty woman? Okay. Well, uh, as many as it takes. That's the answer. As many as it takes. Okay. So where we left off last time. Here is uh, Vivian and Edward. They had a fight because basically uh, today is their last day that they're going to see each other. He only paid for her services for a week and today's the day seven. So that's it. He's going to pay her three grand. She's going to leave. He's never going to see her again. But uh, she's afraid now because uh, coincidentally on the last day uh, that he paid her for, that's the day that she fucking fell in love with him. I don't know weird how that works. Okay, well, she realizes that she's in love with him, of course. Yeah, she's in love. Yeah, she loves him, all right. She loves his fucking money. That's what she loves. Okay, and uh, so she doesn't want him to lose him now. Well, he, he well, good for, good news for her is he decided he was going to pull a Howard Hughes, which basically means that he's going to put her up in an apartment, give her a car, give her a fucking a black Amex, you know, uh, credit card so she can spend whatever the fuck she wants, you know, uh, to make sure that no fucking... Uh, Fancy dancy uh, stores fucking ever turn her away again like they did earlier in the movie, you know. So she said, she, "This is her meal ticket. He's her meal ticket. He's the one that keeps seeing her whenever he's in town. He's gonna swing by uh, the apartment that the posh, nice posh apartment that he paid for for her. So basically, she's a kept woman. All right, uh, that's what he's saying. Okay, now she does not like that because she is in love with him. Now your typical average street fucking hooker uh, would jump at the opportunity. I know plenty myself." That would jump at this opportunity. They have jumped at this opportunity when it's been presented to them. Okay, not not, no, not so much hookers, but like like titty bar dance, like strippers and shit that I know. Okay, oh yeah, they most definitely jump at this opportunity. They take advantage of this. They don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Uh, but uh, Vivian Ward is not like that. Okay, she's she's the hooker uh, with a heart of gold. Okay, so no matter how many cocks she sucks every fucking night.
tonight. The bottom line is that she cares about her about your feelings and she's gonna be true to her own feelings. Okay, that's the important thing here. Not all the fucking cocks, not, not all the time she got fucking uh, filled out like an application or they rode the train on her, okay? The Chinese finger cuffs in her. No, that doesn't matter. What matters is that she's gonna be true to her feelings, okay? And her feelings are that she wants more uh, from Ed Lewis than just to be a kept woman, just a, just an apartment in a, cool, in a cool condo, okay? She has a fantasy of when she was abused as a little girl, her grandma locked her up in the fucking attic and she used to fantasize that she was a princess trapped in a tower and some knight in shining fucking armor on a white fucking horse came over there and fucking climbed the rope to save her, okay? But when he went up there, he didn't offer her a nice fucking condo. Okay, uh, you know, so she's pissed off. She doesn't want that. He tells her, hey, listen, this is the best that I can do right now, Vivian. This is a big step for me, Vivian. I'm not the kind of guy that does this, okay? Okay, so cut me, cut me some slack here. And she's like, I've never, ever treated you like a fucking prostitute. And then he walks away because he gets called away on business. She's like, you just did. Well, what are you? You're a fucking prostitute, okay? This isn't a friendship. This isn't some guy that you met at a club and he's been whining and dining you for the past weekend. You fucking, he's a trick that you picked up off the fucking street, okay? He is a fucking trick. He's paying you, okay? You're not doing this out of the kindness of your heart because you have feelings for him. He's fucking paying you. And now that he's leaving, okay, now all of a sudden you magically developed feelings for him. Now you don't want him to go. You know, cha-ching, of course not. And he, of course, being a typical fucking billionaire, you know, your average, you know, fucking billionaire, good looking, well hung, charming, witty, successful, handsome, no kids, straight, uh, you know, guy that he is, you know, he's realizing that her personality is making him fall in love with her too. Oh, his heart is just starting to open up to bull fucking shit. Bull fucking shit. Dude, come on, man. Ripley don't believe this shit. But anyway, you're supposed to go with that. All right. So, so they left off. The, the last time they saw each other was like that. Okay, so we already know what's going to happen. Vivian's going to threaten to leave again because she knows that works. And whenever she tries to pull away from him, he always runs after her, you know, uh, to get her back. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so you, we know that's what's going to happen. Anyway, meanwhile, downstairs at the lobby of the Beverly Wilshire, okay, which is the five-star hotel that all this drama is taking place at. Okay. You've got uh, Barney Thompson. That's the, he's the general manager played by Hector Elizondo, the famous Puerto Rican character actor. He's downstairs there and uh, he's trying to, he's trying to talk to this woman who is actually Kit. Kit is a uh, uh, Vivian's prostitute friend. Okay. Played by Laura Sanjacomo, who actually, in my opinion, is a hell of a lot better looking than fucking Julia Roberts. I would take fucking uh, Laura San Giacomo over Julia Roberts any day of the week. Not so much in this movie because in this movie she's playing like some Brooklyn trashy type girl that ended up on Hollywood Boulevard turning tricks. You know, uh, some drug addicted fucking, you know, idiot. Okay, but I've seen her in other things, okay, and she's a lot, to me anyway, she's a lot sexier than Julia Roberts will ever be on the best day of her life, okay? Uh, not so much in this movie, but in other stuff that I've seen her in, you know, uh, if you ever look at that old miniseries, The Stand, okay, I know they made a new one last year, the Stephen King miniseries, they made a new one uh, with Amber Heard, Amber Turd, okay, not that one, I'm talking about the one from the 90s, okay, she's in that movie, she plays a character named Nadine Cross, and oh my God, Laura San Giacomo's got tits for fucking days, okay? Sexy as, oh my God, I would totally, fucking jump into that. Uh, but anyway, that's not, we're not talking about that right now. Anyway, so she's there. She's playing the prostitute kit. And of course, she's making a fool of herself. She's she's embarrassing the staff, okay? Because she's obviously, she's trashy, okay? She's in this five-star hotel. So they're trying to kick her out of there, but she claims that she knows a person who's, who's staying in the penthouse. Of course, she knows Vivian. So she calls her up. They call up to confirm this. And of course, she confirms it. So uh, Vivian decides to come downstairs to meet her friend, Kit, uh, for lunch. And, you know, girl talk, okay? Now, you can totally see the change of dynamic here. A lot has happened to Vivian in the past week. Okay, Kit still looks like a drug-addicted street hooker. She's got the jean jacket on, the tight skirt, you know, the fishnet uh, um, pantyhose and all that kind of shit. But meanwhile, uh, Vivian comes down in a fucking $600 fucking summer dress, summer outfit. You know, she's got her hair done professionally. She's got earrings, you know, expensive shoes. Okay, so you can totally see the shift now. She's basically a different woman now than she was. She's not the fucking... Uh, pixie fucking street hooker with the fucking uh, blonde hair, Carol Channing Bob wig, you know, the tight blue skirt and the tight fucking white top. 
okay, that, that with an open back, okay, you know, she's not that anymore, okay, now she looks respectable, now I know she's 22 when she filmed this movie, but now she looks like she's 35, okay, uh, respectable, you know, businesswoman, okay, so they have a talk there outside in the patio, okay, um, you know, uh, actually, kid actually propositioned one of the one of the guests at the hotel, some old man that was staring at her. Okay, uh, so anyway, so they sit by the pool. Okay, on, on the patio. Okay, and basically Vivian recaps her situation. Okay, you know, I I, pay, I went out with that guy. You know, blah blah. blah. He paid me three hundred dollars the first night. Then he gave me three grand if I stayed with him the rest of the week. He, he took me shopping. You know, he took me to the fucking uh, opera. You know, I, I, he took me to this polo game where he fucking revealed to his uh, lawyer that I was a hooker. So now I felt like shit, and I and I chewed it, I chewed his ass out. You know, blah, blah, I forgave him, all that kind of bullshit. And now she's basically, I don't think she told him that she's, a, she didn't tell Laura, uh, Kit that she's in love with him now, but Kit can figure this out on her own, listening to Vivian. She's like, I know you, you know, you fell in love with him, didn't you? You kissed him on the mouth, didn't you? Because that was a rule that Vivian has. She never kisses her tricks, her johns in the mouth. That's too personal. Okay, she'll suck your fucking cock. She'll eat out your asshole. She'll eat your fucking cum. That's acceptable. That's okay. But she will not kiss you on the mouth because that's just fucking disgusting. And that's way the hell too personal. You can fuck her in the ass and cream pie her. That's fine. Okay, just don't fucking kiss her on the mouth because that's fucking disgusting as shit. All right. Okay. Um, you know, you can fucking uh, fill her out, you know. You can fucking ride the train on her, you know, have her fucking double stuffed. Yeah, that's okay. Just don't kiss her on the mouth because that's fucking disgusting. She's got to draw the line somewhere, okay? Uh, and good for her that she has uh, standards and boundaries. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that's going on here. She says, you like him, don't you? Yes, you do. You know, he's not a bum. He's got his shit together. He asked you, didn't he? He asked you to stay with him. Hmm. You know? This is a great opportunity for you, Vivian. You know? And of course, Vivian's like, well, what am I going to do? What am I supposed to do with him? You know, you. she's like, you know, you, you, you buy a diamond and, and some horses. You know, uh, it happens. It could work. And Vivian explains, Vivian explains that it never happens. Okay, she starts point, name dropping some, some hookers that they know. Look, did it happen to her? Did it happen to her? She said, well, first of all, they were crackheads. Okay, that's why their relationships didn't work out. Well, no, they didn't work out because they were fucking hookers. That's why it didn't work out. Everyone keeps keep forgetting that part of it. Okay, um, she's like, she's like, you, we don't even know anyone that it has happened to that this miracle of love relationship has ever happened to. We don't even know anybody. Name somebody, anybody. Okay, where it worked out. And Kiss says, like, you want me to name somebody? Like, like, give you a name? You mean like, like an actual name? You know, like, uh, like, 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 like someone's name, like a real name. You mean an actual, real, honest to God's name? Okay, Cinder fucking Rella. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, this is bullshit. This is fucking bullshit. This is not Cinderella. Cinderella was not a fucking... She was on her knees, but she wasn't fucking sucking cock on her knees. Okay, she was cleaning the fucking floor. Big fucking difference, okay? Uh, big fucking difference. Okay, sorry, Vivian, you are not Cinderella. You're nowhere near Cinderella. Cinderella wouldn't fucking suck cock for a living, okay? She wouldn't, she wouldn't take it up the ass. Not Cinderella, okay? Uh, that's the difference between Cinderella and you, okay? Um, so that's going on here. And the entire time... Uh, this is going on, you know, I just, I can't get my eyes off of the fucking, the black hole uh, that is Julia Roberts' mouth, you know, uh, it's just, yeah, anyway, <laughs> moving right along, okay, the next scene that we see is the meet, is the business meeting between Ed Lewis, okay, and James Morris, now James Morris is played by Ralph Bellamy, he's an old man, He's been a lot of stuff. He was in uh, Rosemary's Baby. He was the asshole stockbroker, one of them, in Trading Places, you know, the old man. Uh, he's been a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I personally, I remember him from the 1941 Wolfman movie, okay, from Universal, okay, back when he was a young man. But he's, been, he's done a lot of shit. You reckon it? He's Ralph Bellamy. He always talks like this. You know who he is? Yeah. He, he sounds like that. Ralph Bellamy. So he plays this guy named James Morris, and he owns... A, 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 a battleship construction company, they build battleships for the Navy, for the United States Armed Forces, okay? Well, this company that he owns, that he runs it as well with his grandson, uh, David Morris, who's also at this meeting, okay? Uh, so you've got the grandfather and the grandson there. 
They run the company, uh, but they're about to be overtaken by Ed's company. Ed uh, purchased, uh, what, I think he said 11 million shares of, of stock from this company. And so he's about to fucking uh, buy it out from under them. Okay, and but he's gonna give me. They're gonna they're gonna get a check for this, but this is their family business. Okay, this is the business that James Morris built when he was a young man back during World War II. So he doesn't necessarily want to give up his business and have this this asshole uh, corporate raider come in there and and buy the company out from out from under him. Okay, and then just to break it apart and sell it to other people. You know, he doesn't want that to happen. So he's trying to fight back Ed. Okay, now the reason Ed's in town was to acquire this company to basically to take it over, but they're fighting back. And what they decided to do is they decided uh, to um, to get a loan to well, they got a loan from this major bank. Okay, it's gonna get it's gonna underwrite their check, and they, they basically put everything they have in mortgage, and they also did profit sharing with their employees to basically buy up all these stock shares. Okay, and the reason they're so hell bent on doing this is because they got awarded a contract from the Navy to build like 13 battleships. Okay, once they get the money for that contract, they're gonna have enough money to buy the stocks back from Ed Lewis. Okay, well, Ed Lewis, being a sneaky, fucking sleazy asshole that he is, he stuck that contract in appropriations. Okay, because he paid off a senator. So now they can't, they're not gonna get the, the, the money for this deal. Okay, uh, and also, uh, Ed Lewis also went to their bank. Yeah, the plan, the one that underwrited their mortgage and basically threatened that he would pull away his company off of their bank if they do this. Okay, so he managed to get the bank to pull away uh, the under, underwriting of the loan that they were going to get. So they are fucked. Okay, Ed Lewis, being a sleazebag corporate raider that he is, he used every fucking dirty trick in the book. Okay, to take over this company, and he succeeded. They can't fight back now. He's 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 outthought them in every he's, he's outthought them in, in every every aspect that they try to fight him with. So they have no choice but to fold. They're going to give up their company to Ed Lewis. So he basically he won. This is what he came to L.A. for to take over this company. Of course, his lawyer Jason Alexander, who plays uh, who plays a character named Philip Stuckey, who's uh, Ed's lawyer. He's a total asshole. Too. He's a sleaze ball. He propositioned Vivian himself at a polo game. Okay, he knows that Vivian's a fucking street hooker and, and he hates the fact that she has a lot of influence on his boss Edward okay but he is happy about fucking taking over his company because it's gonna it's gonna put a lot of money in his pocket as well okay uh, so they're all they're all sleaze balls all the way around okay so they they basically the Morse uh, the Morse family gave up they're gonna let they, they can't fight Ed Lewis anymore he's too strong he's too powerful he knows too many people he has way too much influence they can't fight him back okay so he decides to fold his only concern, he tells uh, Ed, his only concern is that he makes sure, he wants to make sure that Ed uh, takes care of his employees. You know, uh, he doesn't want them to lose their jobs uh, because of this corporate takeover, okay? And of course, uh, Philip Stuckey is like, hey, yeah, all that will be taken care of. Don't worry about it. You know, we promised you that your, your employees will be well taken care of after we take over the company. Okay, you have nothing to worry about. Now let's get over here and start signing some papers, all right? And at this moment, Ed decides to, to cancel the meeting. He orders everybody out of the room, okay? Uh, he asks everyone to leave, okay, including Philip, which pisses off Philip, because Philip's like, well, well, you know, Philip tells everybody, oh yeah, get out, you heard him, get out, and then Ed's like, uh, you too, Phil. He's like, me? Well, why do I gotta leave? But he gets to stay, and he and he points to David Morse, that's the grandson of James Morse. So David Morse agrees to leave as well. So Philip leaves. So now it's to the room is alone, okay? They're alone in this room. It is just Ed Lewis, who's forty years old, and uh, James Morse, who's maybe seventy. <clears throat> he looks like 65, 70 years old. <clears throat> oh man, and they just have a one-on-one -on -one private talk. Okay, and I thought it was very touching here because if you remember earlier in the movie, we know that Ed Lewis has daddy issues, okay? His father was an asshole, left his mom for another woman, you know, uh, took all the money with her, with him when he left. Uh, but yeah, he still ended up, uh, his first car still ended up being a limousine and he still ended up going to private schools. Anyway, uh, when he was an adult, the third company he took over was his father's company, okay? So he's already cathartically uh, destroyed his father broke them apart and sold them off uh, for more than what they're worth. That, that's his MO, and that's what he's going to do to this company as well. So he has a one-on-one -on -one discussion with James Morse here, and he actually offers him uh, some water, some coffee. You know, He pours him a cup of coffee. He says, like, well, he says, well I find myself in a, in a strange situation, James. You know? <laughs> he tells him, you know, uh, he offers him coffee. He says, like, you know, my interests have changed, James. He's like, I no longer want uh, to buy your company and take it apart. I no longer want to do that. Okay? And obviously, this is a metaphor. He's not really talking about the company. Uh, he's talking about his father, okay? which I thought was pretty well, well done. Okay? He says, uh, I no longer want to purchase your company. 
I no, no longer want to buy it and then take it apart and sell it. But I don't want anyone else uh, to get it either. Okay, uh, your company's still extremely vulnerable right now. And I find myself in unfamiliar territory. <sighs> I've decided that I want to help you. Okay, now meanwhile, uh, Philip is outside the door. He's trying to eavesdrop and listen in on what, uh, on what Ed is saying. Okay, and Ed explains to James, the old man, he tells him that, uh, that he lied. He lied about the Navy uh, sticking, um, burying uh, the contract that they had in appropriations. He basically, he sold, slowed it down. He stuck in appropriations, but he did not cancel it. Okay, he just slowed it down. Okay, uh, he was basically bluffing when he told him that, that, uh, that he destroyed their contract uh, with the Navy because they needed that contract to build those ships or else they were going to go bankrupt. All right. Uh, so um, James says, he's like, well, you're very good at bluffing. And it's like, well, that's my job. Okay. Uh, so he shakes hands with them. Okay. And they, they decide to agree. Uh, Ed decides that instead of taking over his company, he decides to go into business with James Morse. Uh, they're going to be business partners. Okay. Because uh, you got to remember, uh, uh, Ed Lewis's company, they don't build anything. They don't make anything. What they do is they acquire, uh, they acquire uh, companies that are in financial distress. They buy them cheap and then they break them apart and they sell them. So they sell the pieces for more than what they spent to buy it. That's his MO. That's his business plan. That's his business model. That's what he does. Okay. Uh, he buys them up when, the, when they're desperate, you know, um, and, uh, and that's what he was about to do here. But he had a change of heart uh, because of his feelings for Vivian. He has decided that uh, Vivian did point out that you don't make anything and you don't, you don't, uh, you know, you don't create anything. You know, you're in your business, he decides that he wants to do something. He doesn't just want to take over companies and sell them off. He actually wants to make something. He wants to make a difference in the world. So he decided to, to help this guy. He said, we're going to go into business for ourselves. We're going to build battleships together. We're going to be partners, you know, <laughs> you know, which I thought was very good of him to do. It was very, very noble. Okay. Uh, so they agreed to go in business together. They both, they both stand up at the same time. And this part really kind of, kind of got to me because uh, the old man, uh, James Morris, when they both stand up together and they agree that they're going to go in business together, they shake hands. And, and James Morris, the old man, he puts his hand on Ed's shoulder. And he says, you know, I find this hard to say without sounding condescending, but I'm proud of you. Tell you what, you know, I got I got emotional. I did, I did, because I saw what was going on here. Obviously, this was a metaphor. This wasn't about uh, them deciding him, him deciding Ed deciding not to take over his company and going into business together with Mr. Morris. That's not what this was about. Obviously, what this was about was this was about uh, Ed getting uh, some sort of redemption uh, for how he treated his father. Now, earlier in the movie, uh, he did mention to uh, Vivian back when he was still getting to know her. Uh, that he missed his father's funeral, that he hadn't spoken to his father in 14 and a half years, and that his father passed away a month earlier. He did not go. His father passed away alone. Uh, so obviously he has bad feelings towards his father. Uh, he was very angry with him, as he said later on in the hot tub, uh, that he spent $10,000 in therapy to be able to say that, I was very angry with my father, you know. Uh, and so he's got daddy issues. He does. Uh, in order for him to escape uh, the feelings that he had towards his father, the hatred he had as his father, he became like his father. He became just like his father. In a cathartic way, like he said earlier that he took over his father's company. That was the third company he ever took over. It was, it was the one that belonged to his dad. And it was cathartic for him. And, and his therapist told him he was cured after that. Like he basically uh, outdid his daughter. He out assholed his own father, you know, which sounds good, I guess, in some way, but really it's heartbreaking. It's really very sad. It's very sad uh, that uh, this was his way of relating to his father. And that he can't help but look at James Morris and seeing his father. James Morris knew his father better uh, than Ed knew his own father, you know. And for James Morris to put his hand on him and tell him I'm very proud of you, you know, made him feel like a son. Probably for the first time in a very, very, very long, probably since he was a child, he felt like a son. Uh, James Morris told him those words that he had wished his father had told him, you know. He had wished his father had not left his mom for another woman. He wished his father had not taken his money, the, his money away when he left his mom. He wishes his mom had not died right after that. You know, there's a lot of anger he's got. 
You know, that maybe he feels that if he had been a better son, his father would have stuck around. If his father had been proud of him, his father never would have left. I think that those are the, the demons that he's dealing with inside, which explains a lot to why he can't get close to people, why he can't trust people because they go away. You know, this is the same story arc as, as he had an officer and gentleman, okay? But basically he feels that he can't get close to people because they'll go away, they'll leave him, okay? So he needs to be the one that leaves first. He needs to be the one that's in charge of the situation. He needs to be the one that makes all the rules, that makes all the decisions, that he's the one that says who gets to go and who gets to stay. He does, okay? Because he's not gonna put himself in that situation again. Uh, but now he's decided that he wants to do something different. He doesn't want to follow that plan anymore. He wants to actually uh, care about the people that he's in business with. You know, he wants to look at them as people instead of assets. Okay, so he decided to make that shift. That's his character arc. Okay, and the fact that this old man, James Woods, uh, put his hand on his shoulder and told him, I'm proud of you. He's basically saying, I'm proud of you, son. You know, you, you ended up not being like me. I was an asshole. And now you've decided that you want actually want to consider other people's feelings. Uh, before you do business, which is something he never did before, uh, you know. So it's a, it's, it's a character arc for him, you know, which is good. Uh, but it really got to me emotionally because I understand what that's like to want that validation from your father, you know. Uh, he never got it from his dad, you know, but he got it from this man. And now he knows what it feels like. Okay, this man represents everything that his father wasn't. This man is actually close to his grandson. Him and his grandson run the company together. You know, it's a family company. That's all they care about. They didn't say, hey, I want more money. They didn't say any of that shit. They just said, take care of the employees. Please, don't fire them. When you take over my company, when you steal my company from me, just please, just take care of the employees. I don't want them to suffer because I lost my company to you. You see what I mean? That, that's, that's a selfless person. Okay, that's something that, that Ed Lewis doesn't really understand. But now he's starting to understand. Maybe if he can become partners with this man, he can learn from this man uh, the lessons that he should have learned from his father if his father stuck around. So I definitely understand this scene. I thought it was very well done. It was a good, it was a good scene here. It was. Okay. Uh, so this is a private view. And I got emotional when he said that. You know, when he said thank you. I got emotional. Okay. Meanwhile, Philip is very upset. Okay. He, they finally open up the doors. Okay. Philip goes back in there. He's upset uh, that his deal changed. He's like, he's like, what the fuck is going on? Okay, and that tells them that they've decided they're going to go into business together. And he wants Ed to fill out the paperwork correctly, uh, to change it up uh, so that he doesn't lose company, that they become partners. Instead of him buying the company out from under, they're going to become partners. Okay, this does not sit well with Philip Stuckey. He's very pissed off. He, he actually loves taking over companies on behalf of his employer, uh, Ed Lewis. He loves it. He, lo he loves the idea of, of killing a, a, a rival, killing some, the competition while, while the throats are exposed. You know, that's when you go in for the kill. He enjoys that. And now he's not going to get to do that. So he's going to miss on this deal. They're not going to take over the company. He's not going to get his money. Okay, so he's very pissed off, very selfish. Uh, he's basically this short Jewish balding guy with glasses. He's a big fucking asshole. Okay, big time. That's Philip Stuckey. Okay, and he's not happy about this at all. Okay, but Ed is happy. He leaves happy and it was a smile on his face. You know, he's like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm starting to change. I'm starting to become a better person, a person that I can live with, you know, instead of being angry all the time. You know, cut off emotionally. Uh, Vivian is teaching me how to open up my heart, how to have feelings, and how to empathize with others. You know, so he leaves out there with a big smile on his face. And later on, he decides to go out in the grass and walk in the grass barefoot, like he did when he was with fucking uh, with Vivian in, in the park in L.A. Okay, so that's his character arc. All right, okay, I'm gonna stop my review right now uh, for a pretty woman, uh, and I will be back shortly to continue my review. Thank you for watching this long, and I'll see you soon on the next one.